We hope you enjoyed that replay with Dr. Bash. She is here live to answer any questions you have. So go ahead and throw those into the Q&A feature. Before that, I think she's got a couple of updates that she'd like to share from the field. Um, Dr. Bash, hi, over to you. Can you hear me okay, Ashley? I hear you perfectly, yes. Okay, wonderful. Yes, thank you. I'd like to give some updates because the original airing was um, back, I believe, in last August. So in October 2023, um, Azi, which is the um, which is the pharmaceutical company that makes lecanemab, they released the Clarity um, AD substudy analysis results. And so they looked specifically at patients in the low tau group. And what they found is in the low tau group, these are the earliest patients that are at the earliest stage of Alzheimer's, that 76% had a reduction in cognitive decline. And actually 60% of the patients had cognitive improvement at 18 months. So those um, percentages are much more positive, much better than what they had originally released. So that's very important data to know. And the key takeaway from that is it is absolutely critical that we diagnose these patients with early Alzheimer's early so that they can get the uh, greatest treatment benefit when they go on therapy. And then in December 2023, we started to get reliable reimbursement for amyloid PET studies. Now, some uh, academic uh, centers started getting more reimbursement even slightly earlier than that, but RADNET, the company that I work for, we started getting reliable reimbursement last December, and we're now doing over 300 amyloid PET studies every single month. So it's just made a tremendous difference because again, patients much prefer to get an amyloid PET for their beta, confirma uh, beta amyloid confirmation rather than an LP. And then in January 1st, 2024, so at the beginning of this year, um, with CPT3 codes went into effect for quantitative MRI. So that's like a Neuroquan or Icometrics. There's other companies as well. But it became very important as of last January to, for us to start billing these patients correctly under these new CPT3 codes, which is 0866T and 0865T. And then what we noticed is in July of 2024, so just a couple of months ago this summer, the MAC started reliably reimbursing for uh, whenever you bill for these studies. So if you, do, for example, do a NeuroQuant study, um, you, you will get about $220 back every time you order that. Uh, if you're outpatient, if you're inpatient, it's going to be more like $230. Uh, same if it's you do I, you know, micrometrics or whatever. Again, there are different vendors. But we started getting reimbursement for all 12 Western states in the United States. And then in the next week or two, we'll expect Florida to go and then the mid-Atlantic states around New Jersey. And then RadNet will petition the remaining max to get reimbursement and they should follow suit. So this is wonderful. This is a, a really exciting news. Um, and then the other big news is in July 2024, um, Dynamic got FDA regulatory uh, approval. So that's Kisunla is what you call um, that medication. And, you know, again, we talked about what the results were for that, the positive results, but Dynamic is now uh, has formal FDA approval and is available. And then um, in August uh, 22nd, 2024, um, we actually started, the, well, the first company obtained clearance for computer automated detection uh, that can assist in ARIA surveillance. So uh, if you remember in the webinar, we, we looked at some sample reports for ARIA surveillance. We, so we looked at what's called NeuroQuant ARIA, and I also showed you a, uh, an IcoBrain ARIA as well, but that NeuroQuant ARIA is now uh, gonna be, is now essentially commercially available uh, because they just recently got FDA clearance to assess for blood products in the brain and then also to assess for edema that you can see with uh, aria e so that's very exciting news and then the very last thing that I wanted to mention is in September 2024, we started getting centeloid values available. What I tend to put all run all pets through the MIM neuroanalysis software, and now we can actually put the centeloid values in our reports. And the neurologists are very interested in that because as patients get to the one year point, they may, I anticipate, start using amyloid PET to see where the patient is in terms of their um, beta amyloid levels. And we can use the centeloids as a quantification of where the patient's at in terms of their beta amyloid levels and, and then make informed decisions about uh, carrying on with maintenance therapy. So those are the big updates. And uh, I think, Ashley, we can move now to the Q&A. Yeah, those are huge updates. And um, I'm, I'm curious about what might be what might be next. What challenges are, are waiting for us uh, next after we've, we've gotten some great updates? So what what are we looking at? Well, I think that we are hitting capacity uh, limitations. So I can tell you at, at RadNet, the, the company I work for, we haven't really hit capacity limitations yet for the MRIs, you know, because obviously the patient needs the baseline MRI and then multiple surveillance MRIs as they're on treatment. 
Um, but other places have sort of reached capacity with MR. They just literally cannot handle that extra burden. Our MRI numbers are up by 21% over the previous year, in large part related to dementia. And so that's one issue. But for us, we've really reached more of a capacity with the amyloid PET. And it's not because we don't have the facilities to do the amyloid PET, but, but we, it's very hard to get enough um, PET techs available. So we've kind of reached our capacity for PET tech. So we've got a little bit of a delay. We're still getting everyone in, but the patients are having to wait a little bit to get in for their amyloid PET. They're not having to wait to get into the MR. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is it's very important for all the neuroradiologists to get the ARIA training prior to reading. Because again, we make a very big impact on whether or not therapy gets held. So that is a big educational effort that's ongoing. Uh, another challenge is communication with the neurologist. If we see ARIA, we, number one, we have to read these cases right away. These patients are waiting for their infusion. And then if we find ARIA, we have to make sure we communicate. And then conversely, the neurologists need to communicate very uh, well with us, whether the patient is presenting for their baseline or whether they're presenting for an ARIA surveillance. Because obviously, if it's a baseline MRI, we don't want to be talking about ARIA in our reports. So that's another thing that's in, in fact, we actually changed our prescription pads so that it, there's a click box for the neurologist to mark, whether it's the baseline or it's the surveillance. So there's a lot of little things that have come up. I'll say one other big challenge that I'd like to encourage everyone here on this call to pay attention to is check your protocols for your GRE sequence. Your TE should be between 20 and 30. If they're set too low because the tech's trying to move fast, you will miss the microhemorrhages every time. So make sure that TE is not around in the fives. It's got to be up in the 20 to 30s to see the blood products. So those are a few of the challenges and how we've sort of overcome them. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So we got a couple questions. Let's go through them. You spoke about ultimately finding a cure. Are there any potential drugs currently undergoing trials for a cure? You know, I'm not sure uh, what is under, there are literally hundreds, like over 400 ongoing trials. But what I can tell you is right now, we don't have any cure. Um, but having said that, again, if you can catch the patient in the early stage, it, you're, mm -hmm. we're seeing, again, 60% of patients have, you know, cognitive improvement and 76% reduction in cognitive decline when you catch them at the early stage. So, you know, for a lethal disease, this is very, very good news, but unfortunately, no, no cure yet. Gotcha. Will ARIA replace a CAA diagnosis? Um, so ARIA, um, ARIA H and CAA look essentially identical on imaging, and it, and I believe that the pathophysiology behind it is also very similar. Um, but we use the term ARIA-H, you know, preferably it should be used only for patients that are on treatment. And so CAA is a diagnosis that you would really make on the baseline MRI. And then you would be counting, you know, the microhemorrhages that may have occurred on treatment after and calling those ARIA-H. But there are a lot of similarities between ARIA-H and CAA. That's helpful. Um, are there any studies looking at behavior modification that might change the progression of AD with these MRI studies? You know, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Again, there are so many trials. I would suspect that there are some looking at those factors, but I'm not personally uh, what trials those are. Do you know if ICO is being paid in the Northeastern states? <laughs> Uh, is is what being paid for the I, quantitative? Yes. Is it being paid in the Northeastern oh, states? Okay. So um, what I was told is that um, New Jersey and the surrounding six states will likely start being paid in the next one to two weeks. Um, New York still is not. But again, like for example, Radnet, who is a big, uh, my company actually petitioned all the MACs and you know, these are still CPT3 codes. So a lot of us didn't think that we would really start getting reimbursement until they convert to CPT1 after we're showing demonstration of a lot of use. But it turns out the MACs actually decided to start reimbursing. So there are still some states, particularly along the Eastern Seaboard, that are not yet being reimbursed. But again, uh, hopefully really will be in the very near future. But again, the whole Western half of the U.S. is right now being reimbursed. Gotcha. How do different imaging complement each other in dementia assessment? This might be a pretty big question. 
No, it's it's actually a very reasonable question. Um, the, clearly, amyloid PET and MRI are the two big imaging mod modalities by far. You know, we used to do much more FDG PET than amyloid PET, but now that we're getting reimbursed for amyloid PET, we're doing much, much more amyloid PET than we are FDG PET in, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, because, you know, again, the reimbursement made all the difference. And you really need to have beta amyloid confirmation before you can go on uh, therapy. So uh, MRI, QMRI, quantitative MRI, like neuroquant, IcoBrain, whatever, um, and uh, amyloid PET are the three big things. FDG PET is used when patients um, have uh, symptoms of memory loss or dementia that they think probably are not related to Alzheimer's disease. So FDG PET's great for FDD and dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, et cetera. CT is not really used much in the dementia space uh, because MRI is so much more sensitive. And so we use MRI, obviously, for the RES surveillance. Um, the CT can be used, though, like, I, for example, I, I had a patient that ended up having a seizure related to to the aria e uh, showed up in the er got a ct you could clearly see the aria e on the ct um but again for aria h and it, it's really better to have the mri so that patient got the ct but then five days later got the mri um, and so CT, I would say, has much of a, a less important role. And again, there are some patients who have contraindications to MRI. Most all, all pacemakers now are MRI compatible, but there are other reasons sometimes why a patient can't get an MRI. So the CT will have some role, but just not a big role. Gotcha. We've got someone asking for your GRE protocol looking for ARIA. Yeah, so uh, what I would be happy to share that. Um, my... Uh, email address, if anyone wants to find me, is, is Susie, S-U-Z-I-E dot bash, B-A-S-H at radnet dot com, R-A-D-N-E-T dot com. And I'm happy to share our protocols, but also know that all of the major vendors have listed the um, uh, recommended protocols on their website. So GE, Siemens, Philips, they all work together to come up with uh, uh, dementia protocols, and those are listed. And the ASNR website also has the recommended protocols as well. And plus, um, I'm a co-author on the uh, appropriate use recommendations paper that was just published in AJNR just two weeks ago. And the recommended protocol is there as well. So that's the American Journal of Neuroradiology. So there's a lot of places that you can get the correct protocol. But the key thing is, is on your GRE please make sure that the TE is set between 20 and 30. It cannot be lower if you want to find the microhemorrhages. Super helpful. Dr. Bash, thank you so much for being here and giving us those amazing updates about, about this field and then answering all our questions. We really, really appreciate you. My pleasure. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Take care. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you everyone else for joining for this replay and for answering such great questions. Be sure to join us next week on Thursday, September 26th at 12 p.m. Dr. Suresh Mukherjee is going to deliver a lecture entitled Part 1, Anatomy and Pathology of the Oral Cavity. You can register for that at mrinline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again for learning with us and have a great day.